We know from our first three lectures that Taiwan was settled by indigenous groups. Um, these are mainly Austronesians, uh, 30 to 50,000 years ago. But until the 17th century, so we, we, have, we know that these indigenous groups are there, but until the 17th century, it was relatively isolated from global trap patterns of trade, or it was, it was considered a remote island to both European and Asian travelers. So it was only 100, it's only about 150 kilometers from the South China mainland, but um, at that time, it wasn't until the 17th century that European commercial expansion incorporated Taiwan into global trade and began a period of intense and rapid transformation of the island. Um, the, in the Dutch case, this was characterized by massive projects of land reclamation for plow agriculture, mainly in the western lowlands. Um, now we know from Chen Di's and Zhang Xie's accounts, we talked about them in the last lecture, that the indigenous peoples did have some trade with Chinese, Filipino, and Japanese pirates. Really, these were merchants who were violating the maritime ban, and they were, of course, called uh, pirates by the name. Um, and this is, of course, we mentioned also that this is how China was able to find an interpreter for this visit. But it was under the direction of the Dutch East India Company, the Veronique de Ost Indies Company, the VOC, from 1624 to 1661, and for in a brief period of Spanish colonial rule in the northern part of the island from 1626 to 1638, so only 12 years ago. That Taiwan was transformed into a functional colonial entrepot, mainly for trading Chinese silk products with Japanese buyers. So, Dutch development policy also dramatically increased the island's trade in indigenous goods such as venison, deer skin, rice, sugar, and rattan. These new industries were aided by Chinese migrants from the southeast coast who were provided with land, tools, and other farming necessities under a Dutch, like an incentive program, basically. They were giving them um, land and tools that they would come and farm. Gradually, these Chinese migrants came to outnumber the Dutch, uh, and a revolt led by the Ming loyalist uh, Zheng Zheng Bong, or sometimes known as Kosinga, in 1661 brought the island under Chinese rule. Kosinga's heirs eventually capitulated to the Manchu rulers who had already overtaken the Chinese mainland, leading to the inclusion of Taiwan into the Qing Empire in 1683. So in this last, last lecture, I give some substance to something I've been arguing for throughout my project as well as this series, the benefits of drawing colonial discourse on Taiwan into a comparative perspective um, by exploring how Chinese and European writers justified the transformative and self-serving interventions into the life of Native peoples on Formosa and elsewhere. And I think by doing this, we gain a clear view of colonial oppression. I focus specifically on how, on how idealized notions of civilization commonly invoked as justifications for the extension of the imperial power reproduce hierarchies of domination, even as they purport to extend to civilization others some recognition of their fundamental equality. So if you recall in the Chinese case, this recognition of equality took the form of acknowledging a shared human nature and the universal capacity of the human being. In the Dutch case, as we will see, the assumption was that human beings were naturally born free, or at least capable of exercising choice. So in this talk, I discuss the ways in which the Dutch representations of Formosa and political life in the 17th century, some of which I've assigned to you as your primary readings, were merely produced by agents of the Dutch East India Company during their four-year control of the island, turned on a presumed similarity between Aboriginal Dutch Aboriginal and Dutch values that ultimately justified the exploitation, in some cases, extermination of indigenous peoples. Um, and in this talk, I actually, um, I've been referring to the native peoples of the island as indigenous people or Aboriginal peoples. Um, Chiu Xin Wei, Chiu Xin Wei, in her recent uh, book published with Brill on Dutch colonial discourse in Taiwan, uses the term Formosan to indicate these islanders, to signal the power and equality that obtained under the colonial conditions to which indigenous people men as a whole were supported by the Dutch East Indian Company. So the idea is that she's referring to them as for most of the, all, despite the fact that they all exhibited different uh, village-based, ethnic-based differences, as a way of signaling the fact that they were all under the domination of the Dutch East Indian Company. And I'm doing that. I'll refer to them in, in, at times so this lecture as for most it's following her precedent. So. These assumed similarities and the colonial institutions they have formed were not simply based on unreflective ethnocentrism or the desire to secure material gain. Rather, I argue they embodied an approach to human nature, here of the Dutch, which saw political life as fundamentally about the protection of the weak. 
These views emerge from discussions about the possibility of Republican rule in the Dutch Low Countries during resistance to the Spanish Habsburg Empire and the gradual political consolidation of the Dutch United Provinces. So, whereas in my earlier lectures I was linking Chinese discourse on Taiwan to broader currents of thought, much of it prompted by the Manchu, uh, the Manchu concrete of, of the Chinese and the kind of intellectual responses there, here I'm trying to understand Dutch discourse about Taiwan is linked in some way to discussions in the Dutch Low Countries at the time, uh, formulated in response as a form of resistance to imperial rule of their own, that of the, the Spanish Habsburgs. Within the particular context of the United Provinces, the Dutch Low Countries, Republican liberty was constituted via institutions such as laws that limited centralized power, historic privileges granted to towns and cities by ruling nobles, and the federalized assembly of the States General. On an interstate level, the East India's in-house legal counsel, Hugo Grotius, who's a very well-known political theorist, um, in fact, the only political theorist that really makes the major uh, uh, features in any kind of major way in this project, endorsed the capacity of local rulers to willfully alienate their sovereignty and their territorial possessions to the Dutch state or trade companies. In sum, in the eyes of Dutch travelers and colonial administrators, Formosans enjoyed a distinctive kind of freedom that, I will argue, both legitimated the alienation of their sovereignty to Dutch colonial rule, while requiring further enhancement through specific forms of political organization imposed by East India Company institutions. So we really are switching gears. I think that there are obvious parallels to Chinese and Dutch discourse about the native Formosans, but at this point, I think it's also important to recognize the distinctive differences. So the Dutch were speaking to different audiences, and they were coming out of a very different kind of political background. Um, scholarly discussion of Dutch activities on the island had actually rarely taken into account this broader context of Dutch political thought in the 17th century. So East India Company activities on Taiwan, of course, have been well studied by people like Tony Andrade for the role they played in securing the company's greater territorial control of the island and for their insight into anthropological and geographic conditions on the island prior to intensified European and Chinese context. So for in terms of understanding pre-colonial status of English peoples, their records have been extremely valuable and fairly well studied. But the peculiar character and subsequent development of company relations with Taiwan's indigenous peoples, including the specific kinds of oppression those relations facilitated, can be fully intelligible only when we take into account how a particular notion of Republican liberty influenced both Dutch perceptions of Formosan political life and subsequent attempts to reorganize it. As Arthur Westheim has shown in recent work on Dutch imperial discourse, contemporary opinion in the Low Countries, quote, characterized and criticized the, the Dutch East India Company in distinctly political terms, unquote, often viewing it as a quasi-state entity or as something that traffics in sovereignty and interest as much as trade. So the yeah, views the Dutch East India Company is a bit of a, and many of these trading companies in the early modern period had a very distinct status. They weren't states, but they effectively had the power to, they had the kind of sovereign authority to impose law and order on these trading on the code, right? They, they acted like states in their extension of power to the foreign colonies. Therefore, it makes sense that we consider how the Dutch East India Company's political theory, as much as its commercial calculations, influenced Dutch interaction with the indigenous inhabitants of Taiwan. So I examined three interconnected examples of how ideas about Republican liberty functioned in Dutch representations of, and subsequent attempts to control or engage the Formosan, these were mainly Sarayan villages on the southwest lowlands of Taiwan, near the Dutch stronghold of Zeelandia. So Zeelandia was actually in present day Anping, which is near Tainan. So if you've ever been to Tainan in Taiwan, you can take a, a bus, a long bus out to Anping and see the remains of this Dutch, of this Dutch fort. So first, I examine the influential account of the first Dutch missionary to Taiwan, George Candidius, who expresses both shock and admiration at the lack of leaders in Sarayan society. They've given you this text for your primary reading, so you've done the reading yourself. Candidius interprets this lack of leadership as a mark of the indigenous people's natural freedom, which he argues should facilitate the willing conversion of the indigenous peoples of this island to Christianity. Second, I explain how this description of natural freedom, which mirrors Dutch beliefs about the origin and developments of political life, reinforced the validity of contracts made by the island's indigenous peoples to freely alienate their sovereignty to the East India Company. Third, as East India, as East India Company agents began contemplating territorial expansion, transforming Zeelandia from a trading factory to a productive trading colony, 
Candidia's successor, Robert Junius, Robert Junius, systematizes the selection of representative leaders from indigenous villages by inviting them to participate in annual celebrations called Lantaka, land days. I show how these land, these land talk and these land days embody key principles of Dutch republicanism, in which the practice of civic virtue plays a, it requires a structure of participation and leadership in order to flourish. The argument thus has several consequences for the study of colonial ideology. Recognizing that Dutch colonial policy on Formosa was neither sui generis nor developed in total isolation from wider ideas circulating in Europe, throws greater light on the political biases inherent in Dutch representations of Formosa's political life. More importantly, it demonstrates the ways in which even ideas such as liberty, seemingly meant to recognize or embody the agency of indigenous peoples, can justify and structure exploitative political relations that systematically elite indigenous understandings of social and political life. Although liberal ideologies have long been recognized by scholars of colonialism as supporting arguments for imperialism, this essay also demonstrates how, in the Formosan case, Republican forms of liberty could also justify and reproduce specific kinds of colonial domination. Now, the Republican versus liber the liberal ideology, this conflict is very prominent in political theory at the moment. So Republican political theory is generally associated with a man named Philip Pettit. He's an Australian philosopher um, at ANU. And he formulated this idea of liberty as non-domination. So he says, whereas liberals see liberty as freedom from coercion, Republicans see liberty as uh, freedom from, uh, from domination. And the reason that Republican liberty is so important here is not only because the way in which the Dutch happened to be understanding it, and for most of the case, understanding it as, as in terms of non-domination, but also that in the Dutch Low Countries, when they talked about freedom, they didn't mean it in the kind of modern liberal sense of being completely untrammeled and able to make free autonomous choices. That really wasn't their emphasis. When they used the word freedom, they were really talking more about um, community-based freedom to be self-governing. And part of what they saw as being self-governing, um, it, it, to them it was a mechanism for avoiding the domination specifically of, of monarchs, of the Habsburgs. But it also meant that each community could make their own decisions about how they hoped to organize trade, um, organize, for example, religious tolerance. It was known as a very tolerant place. Um, so keep in mind, it's important to understand the freedom that government is, is Republican. I'm going to say, I'm going to fill that in a bit more. I'm going to say more about Republican liberty. Um, but part of the appeal of this paper to, I guess, the political theory audiences that I generally write for is that it talks about what is a very long standing debate in contemporary political theory in historical terms. Um, so the problem of Aboriginal authority obviously presented itself because if you see liberty or freedom as having something to do with communal self governance, it's going to become very difficult when you don't have when you have a society such as that of the indigenous promotions that don't necessarily have leaders or have clear leaders and that exercise power in a more diffuse way. So one of the richest sources of information on 17th century Taiwan in any language actually was written by the Dutch Reformed Church missionary Reverend George Candidius. He traveled to Formosa in 1627 with the retinue of Governor General Peter Knotts, who was the, he ended up, Peter Knotts was of course running things on Formosa and Candidius traveled with him in his retinue as a, as a missionary. For the next 18 months, he lived in a bamboo hut among the inhabitants of the Aboriginal village of Xingkan. This is um, Xingang, and now it's the village of Xinshu, near, again near China, near the Dutch fort of Zeelandia. Published in 1628 in Dutch, his account of the inhabitants reports on the basic features of Formosan Aboriginal practices gained from his knowledge of the language and customs of the eight Aboriginal villages within a day's walk of the Dutch fort. Now his account is widely invoked by modern scholars as a reliable, relatively objective account of Aboriginal practices about which little other contemporary information exists. I mean, if he was living there for 18 months, he learned the language. He's actually giving us quite detailed and, and um, factual information, right? But this is not to say that the account does not offer illuminating clues about broader Dutch missionary and colonial preoccupations. Among the most prominent of these is the shared interest of both East Asia Company officials and Chinese missionaries in how Aboriginal political imaginaries could be leveraged to secure the territorial and ideological expansion of the India Company authority. So he begins his account by noting that the inhabitants, quote, do not speak one but several languages, and they have neither king nor governor nor chief. They do not live at peace with each other, one village being continually at war with another village, unquote. His observations tally with, of course, Chinese, as we've just seen, um, as well as other contemporary Spanish and Dutch sources, which all consistently remark on the lack of leaders in Formosan society. 
Although Convidius's description seems to imply that villagers must cope with constant violence due to their ongoing warfare and lack of a designated leader, life within the village as Convidius and other Dutch authorities describe it seems peacefully anarchic. He says they have no general chief who rules over them, but each village is independent. Nor has any village its own headman who governs it, although it may have a nominal council consisting of 12 men of good repute. Every two years, the councillors lay down their office and others are chosen in their stead. The dignity and power of the councillors, however, is not so great that their laws must be obeyed or their commands listened to. But whenever a difficulty arises, they meet and deliberate about the best way of solving it. Having come to a decision, they all call the people of the village together to one of the pal palaver or the idol houses. The question is propounded, and for half an hour, they discuss the pros and cons of the matter. Perfect order is maintained. At their eloquence, I have been thoroughly astonished, for I actually believe Demosthenes himself could not have been more eloquent or had a greater selection of words at his command. The councillors, having finished speaking, the people deliberate about the proposal among themselves, and they may accept what the councillors propose or not, as they think that there's no compulsion, everyone judging for himself of the advantages or disadvantages of the proposal. This sounds like a pretty nice place to live in, right? <laughs> to modernize, the picture that emerges from this account actually is, is, appears unexpectedly democratic, or at least that's what I'm taking away from it. We can decide, I mean, in the discussion, it would be interesting to hear your own thoughts about this, the, the kind of village he's describing. But it seems that the villagers are exer exercising rotation in office, where conciliar deliberative authority is given up willingly and routinely. All members of the village have an opportunity to speak to each other and deliberate about matters of common concern. Argumentative persuasion is emphasized to such a degree that there appears to have developed a practice of rhetoric comparable to that of the ancient Greek masters. And every member of the village seems to be encouraged to think and act independently. It sounds pretty good, right? What few prohibitions do exist among the Soraya, such as not becoming intoxicated during the rice growing season or failing to follow the commands of priestesses, are enforced, Candidius notes, with some wonder, through fines rather than corporal punishment or imprisonment. Now we have here um, an early Dutch representation of, a, of an indigenous council house. I'm pretty sure this is not an accurate representation. I'm pretty sure they did not have like ionic columns in these council houses, but this is a this is taken from an account written by um, one of the governor generals of Formosa called um, like Forsaken Formosa or Lost Formosa. Um, it was an account in which he would produce a lot of Candidius's description of the uh, his account of the inhabitants, but also this guy Coyet also gave his own explanation as to why um, the Dutch lost Taiwan to Kosinga, and he's trying to say why it wasn't his fault, but it kind of was. Um, but anyway, in this, it, what's interesting to me about his account is that it has these images, these engravings that were obviously made in the low, the low countries. I mean, in 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 the Netherlands, the present-day Netherlands, um, in response to what Candidius is describing as these as these these palaces, these, these council houses. So you can see on this side, this is where the, the there's some animals there. And you can see here um, the, the, these are flanking the doors, right? And this is where all of the people are supposed to be. Um, some of them are discussing, and some of them are sort of having these the prostrations. Because Candidius talks at length about um, the power of the priestesses, and the, the priestesses would sort of gyrate and um, prostrate themselves, and they would have, and then they would make sacrifices, and they would make, they would determine what it, certain courses of action. So the ones that the decisions that were not made by conciliar deliberation among the men were made by these priestesses who were endowed with a certain kind of, um, I, um, I suppose, religious authority to make decisions, particularly about when hunting should, should take place, and when the, the hunt should, should go on. Um, anyway, this is what the Dutch thought it looked like. I'm pretty sure it didn't look like that, but I'm, I'm putting it here as, as a kind of comment on um, how Dutch thought about for another trade. Right? It's a representation of otherness that we were talking about. In our last, in our last So what's interesting? I mean, again, I'm interested to hear from all of you, like what you thought about Candidius' description of these of these villages. But for early modern Dutch authorities, these Aboriginal villages didn't seem democratic because that was really actually not a that kind of democracy was not really a vision that, that was available to them historically. This is kind of our modern vision of what, what democracy is, the way I'm describing it. They didn't appear democratic so much as anarchic. 
Governor Martin Song attributed the situation to a lack of desire. Sur the Soraya, he said, simply did not want to have rule by leaders. Each of them, rather, he says, is about as much in charge as anything else. So that's just down to what they want. These descriptions of Sarai villages as ironically both internally well organized, yet ungoverned and anarchic, are supported by two earlier Dutch accounts of Aboriginal life in the nearby village of Solon. These accounts note the strange lack of male authority in Formosan villages. And indeed, they present Aboriginal freedom as an empirical fact of observation. I say, quote, all and sundry are equally free or unfree, nobody being more master than the other. For they have no slaves, servants, or underlings who may sell, hire out, or lend out. Nobody has any, no, neither has anybody the right to meddle with somebody else's business or behavior. Modern scholarly reconstructions of life in these villages, undertaken partly on the basis of these same Dutch records, suggest, of course, that there did exist forms of authority among the Soraya. Inhabitants of those villages closest to the Dutch forts, such as Singpen, So Long, and Favalong, participated in what modern anthropologists, modern anthropologists such as John Shepard, recognized as age grade institutions, constituting a kinship based gerontocracy in which age was a major criterion of authority. So, based on comparisons largely with Polynesian societies and other Austronesian societies, Shepard and others have tried to figure out what was going on on the basis of these records, and they come up with this idea that um, what we're seeing is um, the people at each age had different roles to play. And it wasn't until the men were about 40 or 50 that they stopped hunting and settled down, and that was when permanent marriage-like bonds were formed between men and women. But until that point, women uh, and men had what the Dutch and the Chinese describe as licentious sexual relations, where the men would often go to the women's, the men would sort of live in this central longhouse that would also guard the village, because the, the villages were typically uh, surrounded by fences of some kind, because of all the head hunting, right? We were always having arrival villages coming and trying to like take heads. So the men would live in this longhouse, and the women were the ones who sort of, the property owners, and lived um, in the village in what we would call more conventional houses. They typically lived with their offspring and sometimes with their own. The men would come to a, a woman's house and she would decide whether or not she wanted him to spend the night. Um, and then they would leave, and this would often happen. They would have long term relationships, but they would also have lots of short term relationships. And then, if the women would get pregnant, they would practice um, massage abortion, which is where you massage the uterus and induce an abortion that way until they were in, almost in their late 30s, early 40s. And then they would start having children. So, despite the fact that um, because of their consumption of deer protein, they were actually incredibly healthy people. They also just didn't have, they weren't as populous as you might expect because the women practiced this massage abortion. And a lot of this shepherd determinants was based on age rate institutions where the priestesses would say that it was dangerous for men below a certain age um, to reproduce and to have children. Um, apparently this is found in other kinds of societies similar to this. Uh, I'm not an anthropologist, but this is something actually in my own work I'd like to explore a bit further. And as it happens, when I originally proposed this lecture series to Barbara, I wanted to do a fifth, a fifth lecture on women in Dutch and Chinese records doing something in comparison, because the role of women in these accounts is quite interesting. Um, maybe it's something we can talk about it in the seminar, but there's all these allusions to what women are doing, but then they say, you know, women, they sell the fields, and they decide who they have, and who the sexual partners are, and these priestesses have all this power, but there's no authority in Sarayan society, right? Mm -hmm. It's very strange, you would, I mean, to us, we'd say, well, but obviously there seems to be some authority, it's just not wielded by men, but, but to these Dutch observers and to some of the Chinese ones, they didn't see what women did as having any kind of authority at all. So I think there's something interesting to be said there. However, I, I haven't been able to look into it to the degree that I would like, but it's something to think about maybe for um, our seminar or our discussion later. Um, so Dutch representations obviously are not self-evident or innocently objective descriptions of the reality of indigenous practices or beliefs. By portraying Aboriginal village life as marked by radically devolved sources of authority and decision making, Candidius was in a position to argue for the effectiveness with which the East India Company could extend its support to his proselytizing activities. Okay. With no single authority figure and no tradition of elite argument, he, these villagers, he argues, in a series of letters to Governor Peter Knotts, are in principle uniquely open to rhetoric or persuasion, remaining unhindered in their exercise of free choice. As a consequence, he says, their wills we could bend and lead towards an acceptance of our faith. Now this is really exciting for him because he was saying, well, in other places where the Dutch have tried to extend their power, such as in Southeast Asia, 
Islam had already taken effect. And he said the problem with Islam is it's, it's already brainwashed everyone's minds. There's clear sources of authority. There's a textual tradition that makes it very difficult for Christianity to make any inroads. And the same for the Chinese. He said the Chinese were the same. They were very hard to proselytize. They were very hard to convert to Christianity because they already had a tradition of elite argument. They had a series of very effectual um, authority figures in place telling them sort of what to think and believe, according to him. But he said, these people, they don't have a leader, so we can become the leader and effectively take over. Um, their wills will be bend and lead towards an acceptance of our faith. Again, a part of the civilizing mission, right? These comments present the Aborigines as autonomous agents who could make a free and formed choice to become Christian when presented with the truth of the Gospels. In doing so, they echo views are circulating in the low countries about the origins of political authority as new forms of natural law were being explored as universalist alternatives or additions to religious arguments about human nature. So one of the most influential uh, components of this political theory was formulated most famously by none other than the company's in-house ideologist, Hugo Grotius. Have any of you ever heard of Hugo Grotius prior to me mentioning? You have not. He is called the father of international law. He wrote a text called Mer uh, Mer Liberum on the Free Seas, where he was trying to defend Dutch interests to sail unhindered throughout the oceans that the Spanish and Portuguese were claiming belong to the Pope. So the Spanish and Portuguese are saying the Pope gave us a special dispensation to be able to, to use the oceans basically to navigate the seas. And Hugo Grotius formulates on the basis of legal principles indebted to Roman law rather than to Christian theology, an argument that the seas were free. And indeed, many of the jurisdictional principles that govern the free seas today, the govern maritime law, international maritime law, are indebted to what Hugo Grotius has said. So he's actually incredibly influential in terms of thinking about a law that would extend not just within one jurisdiction, but would extend across jurisdictions. He's also been slippery, as we'll find out. Right? So he was the East. He was he was both an East India Company spokesperson and a political advisor during the early years of the company's establishment in 1604 to 1615. So he had a very close direct relationship um, to the Dutch East India Company. So in his 1609 tract on the freedom of the seas, this mayor of the bear, Grotius advances a universalist theory. So this is in contradiction to the theocrat the, to the theological the theological arguments that were being put forth by the Pope and his representatives in Spain and Portugal, that poses all human beings as both naturally sociable and naturally free. <clears throat> Grotius, this truth could be seen from the fact that God, quote, had not separated human beings, as he had the rest of living things, into different species and various divisions, but had willed them to be of one race and to be known by one name. That furthermore, he had given them the same origin, the same structural organism, the ability to look each other in the face, language too, and other means of communication, in order that they all might recognize their natural social bond and kinship. So it's interesting that here we have another statement of human nature and what it self evidently is supposed to be. On the basis of this premise of a universal human similarity, Grotius goes on to argue that even non Christian heathens, such as the indigenous peoples of the Americas, are free men and therefore should not be subject to the violent conversion attempts to which the Spanish colonizers have subjected them. So, you might, are you familiar with people like um, Victoria and Las, uh, Las Casas? People like that. So, these were, these were Franciscan. Um, they were theologians, but they were also, Victoria in particular was arguing against the extension of, of Spanish rule in the New World. So you might be familiar with you know, the Aztecs, all of that, the, the Spanish Cortez was going in and just basically creating a bloodbath, trying to find gold, right? And he was saying we shouldn't be, that, that, that there's a reason, there's a principal reason why you shouldn't be destroying human life, because they are human, and so we should be rescuing them. We, we should be protecting them, trying to convert them to Christianity, giving them education, we should not be exploiting them in the service of greed, basically. Um, and Grotius's point, too, was to show ultimately that Portugal arrival to Dutch authority in Southeast Asia and the Americas as it happened would be unable to claim private ownership of the seas through papal donation. So what was going on is he's formulating principled arguments against Spanish and Port Portuguese um, claims in the New World and on the seas. But it also happens that they served the interests of the Dutch East India Company, right? They served the more compelling interests of the Dutch East India Company at the same time. So to Grotius, the inherent freedom of the indigenous peoples of America implies that they cannot be subjects of the Pope, and therefore they are not simply subject to whatever the Spanish and the Portuguese were wanting to do with them. He says, quote, the Pope cannot take away from them anything that they have, nor can he take away their right of trading with whomever they please, unquote. 
you may be familiar at this time, it was assumed that the Pope was basically a, a direct phone call to God, right? Like he was he was supposed to be God's representative on earth incarnate, and therefore what he said goes. So when it comes to the point where you're just suddenly discovering new lands and new seas, how do you determine who, who gets it? How do you carve it up, right? Now, of course, they didn't see the indigenous people that were already occupying the land as having any claim upon it, because to them it was terrible, it was, it was empty land. Um, so basically, Grotius is speaking to this debate that they're having about how to carve the world up. And he's saying that the Pope doesn't have authority over the indigenous peoples of the America, despite the fact that he's supposed to be God's representative. In theory, the Spanish and Portuguese are saying, well, God's representative must have authority over everybody on Earth, right? But what Grotius' arguments did was they established legal grounds for a theory of liberty on an interstate scale, so across jurisdictions. He drew from ideas and in intuitions circulating in less precise form as the Dutch expanded their territory explorations over many corners of the globe. Dutch writers and pamphleteers throughout the 15th and 17th centuries resisted arguments made by supporters of Catholic authority that Christian rulers could wage just war against enemies of the church, particularly when these enemies included not only non-Christian Turks, so on Europe's doorstep, but also Christian dissenters in the Netherlands. Formulating an alternative natural law to the one which justified Spanish conquest of the New World in terms of papal jurisdiction, Dutch writers sought to elaborate new terms by which territorial discovery and possession could take place through peaceful interaction with indigenous peoples. So this is another way that Hugo Rochus was selling it. He was saying, well, the Dutch want to have peaceful relationships. They don't want to slaughter these people in the name of getting gold or, or resources or whatever else they're looking for. As Benjamin Schmidt has shown from the time of the voyages of Columbus, when did Columbus sail the ocean blue? 1492, right? So we're talking in the late 15th century. Dutch writers identified themselves with the indigenous peoples of the New World in a shared fight for liberty from Spanish tyranny. So already we're getting some of the background of this. Ascribing to indigenous peoples and rulers an inherent freedom to trade, practice religion, and make contracts, therefore stood as a powerful symbol of Dutch resistance to Spanish Habsburg aggression on their own soil. So they're defending indigenous rights against the Spanish and the Portuguese in a very self-serving way. They say that they're fighting the Spanish in their own soil. Literally, the Spanish are trying to take over the Dutch low countries. Um, and in the process of that, they're defending. They say the Spanish shouldn't be taking over the new world either. And they're basically backtracking. They're kind of backfilling. They're trying to think of arguments that would make the Spanish desist from, from both of these aggressive, these forms of aggression. So early works, early Dutch works, such as Peter Martyr's De Orgo Novo in 1510, situated American indigenous peoples within a, myth, uh, a mythical Ovidian golden age, where their innocence and peace were shattered by their enslavement by the Spanish. Later arguments for the establishment of the Dutch West India Company in 1621 built on these images to claim that establishing a greater presence in the New World would benefit not only Dutch merchants, but also the native peoples. And we have here one representation of the happy kind of uh, traffic and trade that might result when Dutch East India and West India Company officials meet indigenous peoples. Um, to an American, <laughs> this looks like, I mean, they look, they look like pilgrims. I mean, it, it, this is like a very classic representation of what happened in America, you know, as part of my heritage as an American. But of course, you read the history of it and you realize there's, there's nothing but insidious um, uh, instrumental trading uh, interests at stake, the greed, basically. Um, but they try to argue that the establishment of the Dutch West India Company, this was in 1621, so we have a Dutch East India Company in the South Seas, and we have the Dutch West India Company in the New World, was built on images like these to claim that establishing a greater presence in the New World would benefit not only Dutch merchants, but also the native peoples who were just dying to trade with Dutch. According to one of the founders of the West India Company, William Usselings, the natives could now be unyoked from Habsburg rule and the Romish church, that is to say the Pope, to, to finally enjoy their commercial and confessional freedoms, right? So they were helping them be free to realize their natural freedoms. Does this sound familiar? This idea that you have a natural, you have a kind of nature that just is, is waiting for someone to to give life to it and embody it, right? I mean, we, we've seen this argument before, and this is, this is, I feel pretty confident saying this is not my, this is not my intervention, but rather this is, this is quite self-evidently there in the Dutch sources. So the freedom that Candidius and other 17th century Dutch travelers saw in Formosan society, therefore, is neither innocent nor unprecedented. It follows established patterns of Dutch colonial discourse elsewhere, particularly in relation to the New World, that imparted specific roles to indigenous peoples within the Dutch political imaginary. 
Although Gondidius is unusual among his contemporaries for actually living among the Sarayan people in Singhan village, thus having first-hand knowledge about the specificities of life there, his recognition of their freedom stopped short of affirming any kind of genuine agency. Given the thinness of his commitment, it is therefore not surprising that his discourse about native freedom shifted significantly after his first round of proselytizing, his first round of attempting to convert them, produced less than dazzling results, right? Remember, he wrote to Martin Song and said, well, these people are fantastically free, and that means it should be easy to convert them, right? Well, when that didn't work out, he changed his views a bit. As I show below, this shift arises directly from the tensions in a conception that sees freedom as somehow both natural but also capable of expression only in particular sanctioned ways. <clears throat> so, this is where Republican freedom starts to, to come in. In a 1628 letter to the new Governor General, um, J.P. Kuhn, Candidius explains that he could convince the Sincanians to understand scripture but not uh, to not believe in it. In fact, Candidius now argues it was the very lack of central authority in these villages, bereft of headmen or chiefs who could reinforce his message, that frustrated his efforts to further Christianity. The villagers listen to him, he explains, but he is so obstructed and opposed by others who see greater benefit in perpetuating existing village norms particularly in relation to listening to these priestesses, right, which he was really upset about because not only were they not Christian, but they weren't even men. Right? They were females and they were listening to them. At this point, Candidius seems to realize that the freedom of the Aborigines included their capacity to make choices about their spiritual life that did not include his version of Christianity. Right? So the solution to such troubles, Candidius argues, is for the company to admonish its opponents by whom he, he more precisely means those villages and villagers who oppose his own Christian mission, his own Christian mission. Requests for more clearly defined village leadership were clarified and expanded by Candidius' missionary successor, Robert Junius. We have a picture of him here. Um, I actually, I thought, some, I have an image of him on Delftware. Do you know Delftware? So in Delft, yeah, like they, they were uh, uh, producing was it Bone China or Pushland? I'm not sure. And there's an image of him. He was so celebrated for his work in converting the natives of Formosa that they actually put him on China that you could use. Mm -hmm. You could eat off of a face of Robert Junius. Um, but this one is, is actually from, I think, probably from his um, one of his own books, his author books. Um, requests for this village leadership was, was actually expanded by Junius, and it's <coughs> this for which Junius in particular is known. Leonard Blousset identifies him as the main protagonist of the territorial expansion of the East Indian Company on Formosus. He's actually the one who moved on Chaco. This guy, Junius, encouraged the extension of company jurisdiction over heathen villages, specifically to secure what he said were, quote, such political conditions as they deem necessary for the successful spreading of the gospel. Part of this proposal included an official ceremony designed to both awe the Aborigines with Dutch martial power, as well as to garner their willing submission to Dutch rule. The emphasis of these meetings, which were eventually called Lanthagen, land days, on conferring leadership rules among formerly acephalous villagers, that is to say leaderless villagers, suggests the degree to which the lack of central authority in, the, in these villages, once seen as a mark of Aboriginal freedom by Candidius, frustrated Dutch attempts to suborn them. Both Junius and Candidius express confidence that village headmen will enable the Dutch to more effectively carry out pacification of warring villages and to extend control over their territories. As Andrade and others have shown, the inst this institutional innovation did bind the East India Company more closely to its indigenous allies, who enabled East India Company forces to expand their territory much more deeply into the interior. But there were more than strategic reasons for holding such logistically and ritually elaborate ceremonies over here. The reason Lanthagen had to be held at all and contained the specific set of rituals they did flows directly from the logic of Republican freedom. As we saw above in works such as the commentary on the law of the of Booty and on the law of the Free Seas, the Dutch East India Company ideologist Hugo Grotius invoked Roman law as an alternative to papal authority or religious texts for formulating what in his view would be universal principles that could apply both within and outside Christendom, including in relations with non-Christian heathens. Now he was mainly talking about Muslims in Southeast Asia, um, but also extending them to include the indigenous peoples of Taiwan and elsewhere. According to Peter Borsberg, who is a scholar of growth, a, a scholar of history of political thought, these ideas were elaborated directly in response to East India Company activities in the East Indies. 
Roche has justified early Dutch interactions with Asian rulers, such as the King of Johor, during the 1603 incident on the Santa Catarina, which is a Dutch East India Company uh, vessel, as modes of interaction that were duly respectful of the full sovereign capacity of indigenous rulers, and so in accordance with natural law. Roche has held these interactions as evidence of good deeds and what he called, quote, good deeds and offices of commerce, charity, civility, and utility, end quote. And therefore, he argued, were normatively superior to Spanish and Portuguese territorial claims grounded in first discovery or cable domain. It was only through recognizing the sovereignty of indigenous Asian rulers, Roche has argued, that Dutch commercial interests could include treaties in truly international standing. That is to say, they had jurisdiction across States rather than millions of them. Under Grotius' theory of legitimate consent, then, two things were necessary. First, a leader capable of claiming sovereignty over a given territory. Second, that the leader fully understand the nature and reasoning of Dutch requests for the alienation of his sovereignty. Absent a clear village leader in whom was presumably invested the singular authority to make decisions of this magnitude, Grotius' theory of just possession would be meaningless. The various process of so-called free consent thus could not be accomplished without substituting the relatively acephalous governance structure of Aboriginal villages with a headman-based system of representatives who could act as leaders of villages and thus as bearers of sovereignty. And once you have bearers of sovereignty in place, the Dutch could claim they were freely alienating their sovereignty to the Dutch East India Company, just like with the King of Johor. Right? In using land day rituals to act out an exchange of equal participation, or in other words, acting as if the Formosan vassals of the Dutch East India Company were both capable of and willing to cede their sovereignty in an act of free and equal exchange, the company effectively inducted Formosan natives into the world of natural law declared by Grotius. The recognition of Aboriginal freedom as a natural condition had now morphed into freedom as an implied ability to consent to East India Company territorial and economic expansion on the island. So it was in other words by implementing ideas about um, representation and about headship, that the Dutch East India Company was capable of carrying out what they argued was a peaceful alienation <clears throat> of indigenous sovereignty on Formosa. What they would basically do is go into villages and designate a headman, and they would often give this person, who's usually a man, um, an elaborate velvet robe and a, and a cane, <laughs> a, like a rattan cane. It was very, these were very elaborate. They were all fashioned in the Dutch low countries and shipped over, so it was it, quite a, a lot of expense. And we have evidence that these um, this, these capes and this um, these staffs or these kind of, I don't know what you would call them these big poles that they would have that sort of show their, their their authority were passed down. They were meant to be passed down from headman to headman. So every year a new headman would be elected and it would be passed down to that person. But it turns out that um, that also didn't really abide by indigenous customs. So often they would they would suddenly go missing because people would pass them down to their sons. Um, rather than passing them on to the community. They were already in violation of, of, what Dutch, the, uh, of, of what the Dutch took to be elected authority. <coughs> and then once these headmen were sort of elected, they would be sent to these land days. And you see a, a de depiction of one here. And they were expected to be, um, they were expected to basically have intercourse with the Dutch in a free and unfriendly way. So the company officials felt that it was extremely important. Antonio Andrade has done a very extensive examination of these conduct. Um, the Dutch, the, the Dutch rule felt by the, was felt by the native villagers as a thing of joyful and active participation. So these, these villagers were actually supposed to come freely and willingly and enjoy themselves at these celebrations. So in other words, it, the Dutch had to stage some kind of performative activity in which they could satisfy themselves that the indigenous leaders that they had just created were freely alienating their sovereignty. And Therefore, the Dutch could willingly and easily and legally take their land away from them. That was basically what was happening here. And if people question them, they could say, well, no, obviously it was undertaken freely and willingly because you have these people here engaging in these activities. Um, and they told us that it would be okay if, if you alienated, if, if they gave us our, they said it would be okay if, if the territory that belonged to them was given to us. Now, of course, this imposes all, all manner of concepts of property and ownership that were not shared, obviously, by the indigenous villagers. But one of the ways that that was masked or carried over was by the election of headmen, of course, appointed by company officials. They even told participants to the Islam Thaven that they should, that they should quote, not give in to nervousness or fear, but should rather speak nothing other than their true and sincere will. Since this was a free and unconstrained meeting, and even if they had committed great mistakes, they would nonetheless be allowed to go their way as free men, unquote. 
On this basis, Andrade argues that land days were intended to be perceived, at least partly, as a participatory meeting, a place for the elders to share their grievances and to share in government. Although Andrade does not elaborate further, we might wonder what is motivating the rather odd requirement for joyful and active participation, particularly if the Dutch were interested only or primarily in native compliance to advance their commercial and territorial interests. What kinds of free men did they now expect these newly ensconced village leaders to be? And how is it possible that the Dutch could honestly believe that participation in such ceremonies could meaningfully amount to having what Tony Andrade has identified as a shared government? Insofar as Dutch colonial administrators in Taiwan are no longer convinced that the natural freedom of the Formosans worked in their favor, we may have to look more closely at how Dutch thinkers generally understood liberty to work. It is important to remember that the version of Republican liberty defended by Dutch jurists and pamphleteers during and subsequent to the revolt against Spain departed from more well-known and liberal accounts which tend to define liberty as the absence of unjustified constraints on action, i.e. as the absence of coercion. For many of the Dutch of this period, at least, liberty was defined more positively as constituted by political self-determination in contrast to papal or tyrannical authority. So they were trying to reject the authority of both the Pope as well as the monarchs. It was not meaningful as a pre-political condition that could somehow be enjoyed simply or now. Rather, it could flourish only in the presence of appropriate institutions that systematized and checked political authority and recognized Now, one of the distinctive features of Dutch Republican liberty was its reliance on ancient traditions of local laws and privileges in the Dutch Low Countries, both to legitimate resistance to Spanish rule and to elaborate a further understanding of the kinds of liberty the revolt was meant to secure. The ideas of liberty that resulted from these discussions was not homogenous, systematic, or uncontested. But they did tend to center on the idea that the political order was originally created to secure liberty. They focused specifically on the role played by long-standing institutions such as the States General, an assembly of local representative authorities that enjoyed increasing powers over taxation and defense as the Dutch Republic consolidated in the 17th century. So it's seen here in this, in this etching. In both making possible the representation of local interests while preventing the colonies' consolidation of power in a single ruler. So they saw the antidote to papal authority and monarchical power in these kinds of assemblies. It's notable that for the Dutch, representatives of each of these states, it's a bit of a federalist system, were generally elected, they were elected elites. They were defended as embodying the sovereignty of the people and the process of communicating local interests to the General Assembly, but these representatives did not serve an explicitly democratic purpose in the way we might recognize today. As described by Francois Franck in a 1587 defense of the States General, which was to be eventually recognized as the Dutch Magna Carta, the College of Counselors historically enjoyed in Holland and other states was comprised of the most esteemed of the rep of their representative town or city to whom they owed their loyalty, and in them collectively was vested the sovereignty of the entire people. So we're not talking about one person, one vote democracy, we're talking more about community representation. And they were represented, they were represented, perhaps not surprisingly, by local elites, not by, you know, it wasn't the case that just anyone could become a representative. Of course, that's probably true still today. The sovereignty did not translate into popular participation on a local level, however, so much as it was a tool for ensuring the liberty of all through the maintenance of privileges. The people as a whole did not, nor were they seen as exercising any real influence over their rulers. For early 17th century Dutch thinkers, such as Brederode and others, including Paulus Blusius, the distinguishing marks of classical republicanism, the ideal towards which many of these political theories oriented, were the, the autonomy of the citizen, rotation of office, and collegial government. So I think that this tripartite description of the ideal of Republican participatory government helps to make sense of the land based ceremonies with their requirements for annual rotation of headmen, joyfully participating in rituals unrelated to direct influence on Dutch policy. By offering villages the opportunity to choose their leaders and sometimes to stand as representatives for these land day ceremonies, Junius and his East India Company colleagues were creating a situation in which the freedom, the so-called freedom or autonomy of the villagers could be meaningfully affirmed in Dutch terms. These quasi-elite village representatives participated in government in the sense that they were, in principle, akin to states' representatives, much like in the Dutch Low Countries, who, who practiced rotation in office. 
In the collegial or assembly-like atmosphere of the land day ceremony, these representatives were seen as free to air their grievances with the company. So we have a contrast here between this image and, and the one that I just showed you. I, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe part of the imaginary from which Robert Junius drew the idea for these land day ceremonies is indebted to the state general, this institution that prevailed in the Dutch low countries. The land day did not extend to voting procedures for East India Company offices, but it did operate as an affirmation of the representative support for company policy over each respective village. Although obviously conceived to advance company interests, affirmation of support by the Formosans was not a totally empty declaration. As Tonio Andrade has shown, East India Company policy was shaped pretty profoundly by decisions of villages to ally or not with the company and its decisions to extend their territorial, territorial authority further. So against this background, it's perhaps not surprising that despite the celebration of the natural freedom enjoyed by the Sincandians, Candidius argues in his letter to Governor Nouns that the problem was precisely, quote, no republic can exist without rulers and laws, and this place has neither, unquote. This general political theory also informs Candidius' original influential description of Aboriginal village life as anarchic, where what to us might seem to be strikingly democratic and well-organized modes of governance are translated in his account into markers of the inadequacy of village politics. Even in the face of its obvious efficacy in enforcing laws and rules without resort to physical punishment, Candidius persists in describing village governance in terms of lack. The only solution was to have our magistrates, he says, that's his word, offer protection and assistance to the seven villages already occupied by East India Company forces, and grant similar privileges to all those other villages willing to submit to company laws. His successor, Junius, expanded this belief in law and order as the backbone of a prosperous republic to extend company authority and territorial control via these elaborate land based ceremonies which in turn enforced judicial and other leadership innovations made by the East India Company at the village level. So the point is not to say that Junius, Candidius, or the East India Company leadership replicated Dutch Republican institutions exactly in their reorganization of the shrine villages. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply arguing that their recommendations had clear reference in the literature of the Dutch Revolt and the subsequent consolidation of the Dutch Republic, where freedom was seen to operate in particular ways and to require specific forms of political institutions. Adam Pulo has recently argued that East India Company officials treated the sovereignty acquired through such exchanges as the Lentagen to be malleable and really turned to the organization's advantage. His interpretation of East India Company actions in Formosa counts them among a range of mechanisms through which the company acquired sovereignty over Asian territory, all of which, he says, quote, were subject to ready manipulation to ensure the best opportunities for profit and power, unquote. Yet when placed within the broader context of a political thought that inscribes the notion of freedom with specific content and forms of practice, it becomes clear that it's not through violation of native political rights, but rather only by means of their conferral and recognition that East India Company authority could be extended throughout Formosan territory. The land day ceremonies and the designation of native headmen or leaders subject to company control and guidance in managing village life were in some ways designed to exemplify rather than suppress the freedom of Formosans. That, it was, that is, it was only by instantiating villagers with political rights that their actions could be rendered legible to company officials as constituting genuine and free consent to the alienation of their sovereignty to the company. And only through the institutionalization of political authority in the form of village leaders could the participatory promise of a presumably self-determining republic function to satisfy the requirements of true republican liberty. So to conclude, in this lecture I've tried to show how the freedom into which Aboriginal practices were translated by Dutch colonial administrators and missionaries supported three different yet mutually reinforcing arguments on the part of the Dutch. The first argument was that this lack of authority in Aboriginal villages implied a pre-political native simplicity and purity. For Candidius, this translated into fewer barriers to converting their members to Christianity. The second argument about freedom was that, given the perceived freedom of Taiwan's Aboriginal population, Dutch authorities could meaningfully claim possession of their territory through the freely given consent of these indigenous peoples. The third was that the ritualized submission to Dutch rule, symbolized in the Lanthagen ceremonies instituted by Candidius' successor Robert Junius in the 1630s, could be interpreted as an enhancement, a necessary institutionalization of native liberty, which to Dutch rep Republicans required specific forms of free political participation to, in order to develop fully. These expectations served Dutch interests, of course, 
but they proceeded on the basis of a belief that the free status of the Aborigines legitimated and justified Dutch activities that ultimately served to displace the Aboriginal way of life. By illustrating these connections as they played out on Dutch colonial possessions on Taiwan, we are better able to situate Taiwan within the global, rather than merely regional or local circulations of ideas and power that constituted its history. And conversely, by connecting these practices to a local form of Republican liberty as understood in the Dutch Republic, also to position Taiwan's island history as playing an important role in European political view. Why did uh, why was uh, Taiwan not uh, explored or colonized uh, by China much earlier? I mean, in the 15th century, Zheng uh, He went as far as Africa, Africa. So I mean, Taiwan is right here. So why was it so uh, foreign, so strange to them? Um. So. I, no one really knows. We there's actually Chandi actually mentions in his report. I don't know if you remember this that that John Ho, that John Ho visited Taiwan and gave bells to these. So like the indigenous people wore, wore bells that were I think bronze bells that were cast. So they, they knew that they were training with someone and they had these bells that they would wear. And there's there's representations. I wasn't able to find it in time for this lecture, but there are representations of indigenous peoples on Taiwan wearing these bells, and it was believed that they were given these by John Ho. But that might be mythical. So I don't know that Jungma actually went there. Um, but the, the reason that's usually given is that um, Taiwan was not seen as profitable in any way. There wasn't any reason for the Chinese to go. They just saw it as a haven for pirates. Like it, it was known as like kind of like a hideout place for, for people doing nefarious things. There was no obvious. It wasn't until later that they discovered there might be sulfur or gold. Um, and then later it became, under, under Yongzheng and Qianlong, one of the reasons that the debates about what to do with Taiwan were so vociferous was A, that it was incredibly rebellion ridden, but B, they also finally saw it as an opportunity to provide Fujian with rice. So it was like a, a rice, what do you call it, rice bowl. Like it was actually rice production was, was starting to increase. But up until that point, um, a lot of what was being traded by these Japanese and Chinese merchants were deer skins for samurai in Japan, because apparently it was like a fashion to have these like deer skin oh. and deer antler um, headdresses and things. Mm -hmm. And this was this was the main reason that the J Japan, there was, there was a bit of a scuffle. I don't, I mentioned it in the longer period, but there was a bit of a scuffle with, between uh, certain Japanese traders and the Dutch. So the Dutch tried to say, oh, we're here now. We've established a trading factory. You need a license if you want to trade with Taiwan. But there were Japanese merchants who had been trading on Taiwan for decades before the Dutch got there. So this and what they were trading century. were these deer skins with the indigenous peoples. So the deer thing is the 17th century, right? Is uh, 17th, 17th century. century. 17th century. So it's, that's what we know. I mean, how long it was going on for, I don't know. But I, we know that it was going on. It was, it was, it was flourishing in the early 17th century, yeah. this, this trade. Yeah. So it was going on um, for samurai to wear deer skin. Um, but they didn't think, but, but that is just to say that the Chinese didn't think there was much of value there. Uh -huh. And the Dutch wanted it because they were interested in the China trade. They were interested in uh -huh. trying to find a way to uh, circumvent the Ming and uh, the Tokugawa maritime bands. Mm. They wanted to train Chinese silk mm. on the European market, but they couldn't find a way to, if, if they could trade with Taiwan, it was like a, a you call it a triangular trade. Um, and that, but, but it, it was seen as a ball of mud. Like I think Tianlong called it a like, big ball of mud. Mm -hmm. It was worthless mm -hmm. to them. But the Dutch saw it as a, as a way of getting a foothold in Japan. So they were on the pescadors. The Dutch first went to the pescadors. And they were sort of waiting there. And one of the, um, they wanted originally to push to trade with, with the Ming. And the, the Ming kind of kept them waiting and strung them along because the Ming didn't care. They didn't care. Um, and then they, they sort of scared them. They sent a fleet out and they sort of scared them off. And then they, they ended up in Thailand or near Thailand. Mm -hmm. And that's where they established this the representation of the Dutch. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason. I mean, that's the reason it's usually given in the literature. Whether that's a good reason or not, yeah. I don't know. Uh, do you know if there is uh, research, or have you done something on uh, maybe there were debates? Maybe we should go there. Maybe not uh, earlier. Uh, um, so, in one of the readings I gave, the Lawrence Thompson readings, he basically 
the reason that's a valuable article is that he translates a bunch of stuff, but he also brings everything together, everything that's known about Taiwan. And um, since then, since Taiwan Studies has taken off in Taiwan, there's been more Chinese language scholarship on the origins of Taiwan. Like, what, like how were people talking about it before, you know, pre-colonial times, before the Dutch came, before the Chinese came, and they haven't actually been able to find anything. There's not a lot of mention of it in, in Chinese records at all. Like the fact that people just see it as a there's an island, they know it's there, but they're not that interested in. I guess partly it's to us. Maybe this is a modern, or maybe this is a, a specific kind of cultural, a kind of curiosity. Of people. Well, when, when you just want to find out what's there, I mean, you know, if you, you have junk here running around, like, why don't you just go and have a sense of adventure and, and try out what's, but, but I don't think that they, the Chinese, especially not elite Chinese, really had that kind of curiosity. They didn't care, they didn't need to care. They were living fine. They didn't have any reason to go exploring. Um, Zheng He went exploring, and then immediately after that, there were maritime bans where people said, well, we don't really need to be trading with the outside world, so that would further discourage exploration. So. Well, I mean, Qin Shi Huang wanted to find the pill of immortality, but apparently he didn't uh, go yeah. far enough. I don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of a, of a mystery. I mean, it's often presented that way, like, yeah. oh, the Chinese never touch it, and then the Dutch came, and that's, and that's what integrated Taiwan into global trade, but um, I may have mentioned I'm, I'm writing another separate article with another colleague of mine um, who studies uh, Spanish and Japanese representations of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to say that actually the indigenous people in Taiwan were already engaged in. They were already, always already global in the sense that they were integrated in patterns of trade that were larger than Taiwan. Mm -hmm. In a way, they knew more about the world than the, the Chinese did, right? Because they knew they had people coming from mm -hmm. Japan, the Philippines, China, oh. um, maybe further afield to trade, to trade in also other Australian peoples to trade with them. So we're trying to think about that as a way of subverting these you know, Taiwan was so isolated. Well, not to the indigenous people that were living there. They were having trade with lots of oh. people, right? Just to, to China. China just didn't explore it. So this is your published paper? Oh, not yet. I, just, uh, okay. I may see it. Okay. <laughs> but that's okay there. Currently under research. Okay. Currently advancing research. But I, I, I've become interested in this because mm. Taiwan is kind of an interesting case. Mm. It doesn't fit neatly into any kind of nationalist narrative. I, I raised this at the very, very beginning of this lecture series where I had, um, why, why hasn't Taiwan been talked about more in colonial studies? Because it has such a long colonial history. Of, it just seems like an obvious part, but I, I wonder if the reason, and I don't know this, but I think that the reason might be it's just too complex, that there's too much going on, leading in too many different directions, not just into one national narrative or the, the history of one colonial empire, but into many. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, if you ever come up with a, if you can find a better answer, I'd, I'd be happy to entertain it. But. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually have two more questions right away. Uh, you mentioned that they had uh, in those uh, self-organized uh, villages uh, they had fines instead of corporate. Uh, what kind of fines? What kind of commodity was it that you have? Um, often textiles, which were very valued. Um, they called them uh, kansans. It might have been, I don't know if this was something you guys managed to look at in your object lessons. Okay. In Zhenghuang, they also used the textile. Like the yeah. silk as kind of like money. As a currency, because it, yeah, it was considered yes. extremely valuable. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think that um, some of it was traded for, like it, it, some of it was made out of silk, so some of it was in, it was imported, it was very considered very valuable. Or livestock, or mm -hmm. uh, weapons. So these are, are they just, because the cloths that we looked at, or the textiles that we looked at, some of them were just pieces of cloths. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, usually, it was my understanding that these would be large, like we would call them bolts. Oh, maybe bolts. We didn't see larger. I mean, I don't know if any of them exist. Yeah. I mean, you know, textiles have a very limited life. But um, <laughs> even for murder and adultery and like um, people who killed each other, like so, so murder was not considered. It just wasn't taken as seriously. Often the person would run away, uh -huh. and then if you stayed away long enough, he would be okay. Like he'd be sort of in exile for a long time, and then he'd come back and would be hey, okay. or he would be tracked down and he would be forced to give something quite valuable, maybe some pigs or, or something to the person whose family, like the person's family, the person who killed mm -hmm. him. Um, but but th this is what we know. I mean, Candidius's account is one of the only ones we have of what we call pre-colonial indigenous life. Because once the Dutch came, of course, then they disrupted everything and things started to change completely. Uh, because they tried to educate them. 
in Dutch values, and that included, you know, let's have a nuclear family, let's start reproducing at an early age, let's have women, let's give women these specific kinds of roles. Mm-hmm. They're not allowed to farm, it's the men who farm, it's the men who own the property. Um, by instituting uh, like village-based schools, they managed to affect differences over about a generation. So by the time the Dutch got there, already things were changing, so this is this is their pre-colonial state, as far as we know. I just forgot, forgot to ask, you mentioned those bells, uh, which Zheng He did or did not give them. Um, do we have any of those bells, or have they all been lost in bells. I don't, I don't, they were like bells that like they wore on their wrists and their okay. ankles. Um, we have images, Dutch images, of indigenous people wearing such bells, uh, but whether the bells themselves exist, I don't. I don't know enough about the, okay. about, about the material history of Taiwan. It would be interesting to know. You know, now that I'm reading all these Dutch records, I suddenly become, I'm, one of the things I'm really interested in anthropo- is the anthropology, because in political theory, we have no way of talking about non-democratic societies. Like, I don't even know how to read the records that the Dutch are leaving about the way these villages were governed. How do you talk about authority in the way, like, what are, we, what are we looking at here? How do we... How do we make comparisons with other, presumably with other Austronesian societies, which is usually how anthropologists go about doing it? They make comparisons with similar societies with similar kinds of governance structures, and they have they have a taxonomy that helps us understand well, what variety of authority is this. But I feel quite at a loss in political theory. We talk about like you know we have like leaders and leadership, and you have elected leaders or you have monarchical leaders, but you don't really have an imaginary for thinking about. Um, and I set an acephalous society, a headless society, like like that of the Soraya. I and mean, to me, it's, like, it's it's quite interesting. So it's leading me in all kinds of different directions, including in that not really anthropology. But I feel like I'm not quite in the position where I can answer questions like that. But what do you mean you can only talk about democratic? Well, I don't mean I don't mean because I, mean, I, mean, I, um, I think that field as a whole oh. is profoundly impoverished in the sense that it mainly oh. focuses on. Well, it's overwhelmingly contemporary yeah, democratic. Okay, okay. Like, like I, I find it very hard to imagine a non-democratic. Like, we well, don't, we don't have a political theory of like tribal uh, governance, for example. Nobody talks about it in political philosophy, which is weird because why wouldn't they? And it's it's even hard to understand, for example, political theory. We have no no one's working on normative defense of a non-democratic society. But but most people still today would probably live under non democratic societies, right? And certainly throughout history, they've lived in non democratic societies. So how do you think about legitimate authority or sovereignty in those kinds of situations? And I don't think we have it. I mean, I I thought I I confronted my own inability to think creatively about it. We we don't have the training. I don't have the training to do that. So who who does have the training? Probably anthropologists. But it that's just an aside. But yeah, it's. It's, it, this has led me into all kinds of really exciting directions. I hope to. Some someday I hope to become worthy of the material. If that makes sense, but you know I'm still working through that. Mm-hmm. And you saw a question, right? You yeah. still have it. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, That's wonderful. Uh, You're well, uh, saving all the questions for me. Bells existed, they were made of metal apparently, so they should be preserved somewhere. Uh, yeah, well, unless they got washed away or buried or hidden or, or I don't know. We can ask the museum. In the ocean. <laughs> yeah, then we, just, then we, we can have make another sure. object lesson. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, maybe if I, I mean, if you email me, I can try to find it. I know that I've seen pictures, like like the one, does he have the, maybe he has the bells. Yeah, he has. Yeah, yes. here we are. He's on his hand. On his hand. I think that's I think that's what it is. Mm. And it's a bell and it's not. It's a it's, it's, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it should be. Uh, that's my understanding is that it's these mm-hmm. and Chundi talks about them as well. Yeah. I'm from Austin. Okay, so we're done. So it's uh, Angel. I think and she's also first. Okay. His first. Yeah. Okay. I just quickly ask this question. Because uh, you had those two deceptions of political practice and um, and um, visual deceptions. The first one showing the imaginary practice for Muslims. Not this one, the one that done by the Dutch. Oh, oh yeah, that, that one, that one, yeah. And this one, and I find it really interesting in the juxtaposition with the second one that shows like Prince Hed- Frederick. Uh, Hendrik, though, do you know which one? In like a couple of slides, the coronation of yes. And those two have uh, shown the political practice. I was see here is a dog in the front, and you can see oh. how much how much oh. chaos do you see in the first one of it, and the dog running around with the, all of the people totally freely. And in the second one, you have this totally subordinated animal walking. Ah. Yeah. 
That's interesting. And you're showing the first one is showing like this huge chaos of the political practice somehow. Like right there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, wow, that's really deep. I was just. <laughs> I was just. I didn't even notice there was a dog there. I'll be honest with you. Oh, that's amazing. So this is this tells us something about that representation yeah. of an yeah. life, doesn't it? Cool. Mm -hmm. Just about the vibe that they were talking about that the political practice did exist, and they showed this weird representation <laughs> of it and how it looked in their mind. But how, like, considering how chaotic it is on this one, and how stated it is on the second one, and this was mm -hmm. produced at the same time. Huh. Is it? But it's not the same artist, right? Uh, no. You know, I. So this tells you how little I know about art history, or how how little I, I I'm attuned to it. Um, I, I, to me, they're just beautiful images, and I'm, I'm so ecstatic that, as somebody who's talked about ideas for so long, I finally get to engage in looking at images, right? That I can actually show images yeah, and, and use them to illustrate my argument rather than just like I don't know talking about the like, words and abstractions. Um, so, I, like, I, it had never even occurred to me to think about because the dog. Only one. Yeah, the dog. Well, uh, but also, but also who. What were the conditions of their production, right? Like, who was the engraver? When were they produced? Um, how were they received? How were they looked at? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go, ahead. You go ahead. If you ask no, me no, 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 first, no, no. because I want to. <laughs> please, please. Yeah. I just, I just, I just wonder. Was wondering why was there only one reception of one animal in front of both of them? It was like a tradition in a Dutch. Painting at that time. Like a like a like uh, a symbol or something. Yes. I thought yeah. that was not an art historic symbol. Yeah. Just... Is that a monkey? Where's the monkey? Left corner? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Left. Uh, I mean, the the, the, the yeah, lower lower part of the slip? Yes. Well, well, it's it's actually easier more. to see it here yeah. than it is on my side. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it looks like a small, very small person. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a is it a child? Who's Cornish? I think it's a it's a from the three brick hand brick prints from the Oran here from the in the states of the Oran. Yeah. Well, he's the stockholder. So this is the interesting thing. They had somebody who's basically like a king, yeah. but wasn't. So and that was the head of the Orange, right? He was like the head of this of the Scots general. Um, and he was her ruler, but he wasn't supposed to be ruling, he was supposed to be just the I guess like the chair of the department who was in the <laughs> chair of the department. Uh, but but he, he did have power, yeah, he had his own. Yeah. But it's interesting, first of all, in terms of light. Because uh, this part is so shadowed, right? So I yeah. wonder why this is the case. And then also, um, this, the, they are basically, are they drinking or what are they doing? I mean, they are also in the night, mm. but why? And what's this left part of the picture? Mm -hmm. should, should be important, light. that's why they give us oh. spotlight. I think the, the light... They are all important? So yes. guys up there are two? I think it can be both, like, uh, you know. Yeah, so, so um, of course, what we would like you to do is not to have this illustrate your argument, but to make to I mean, this be an idea. argument. And in order, so um, if you go back to the other picture, the one with the dog on the, yeah, on the actually, stairs. Yeah, my question is related well, to that one. Related to the other one. Yeah, the other yeah, one. I have a question to the, this one and the other one in relation to each other because. Um, I wonder, you know, what's the truth factor or the re reality factor of the other mm -hmm. one? I don't think I've ever seen such a building in Taiwan. Right? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. Oh, no. So, so the, 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 and also, you know, yeah. Taiwanese Aborigines, so if you go to, can we go back to this one? This one with the dogs? No, the, um, uh, that so one. Yeah, so if, <laughs> I mean, they don't, they, they don't dress like this. So, yeah. you know, yeah. you had the yeah. Indian. Type Taiwanese Aborigine before, and then you have this, which is basically looks like a Dutch. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It looks like the other Dutch uh, nobleman that you saw in the. In the well, you know, I saw. This, it was funny because I read this book, uh, this Koyet, you know, because he's. Yeah. I checked it out of the library and has all these images in it, and I had assumed that this was just like often in this. I mean, in, in lots of European um, sort of books about different societies, they would have this like elaborate, like usually often a woman, you know, like a symbol of discovery, you know, who would be holding off something and she would have like all of the, 
the, the naked and girdled peoples of the world, like around her or whatever. Um, so I thought it was like some kind of like symbolic, like that just sort of fronts piece. And then and then it says, I think, oh, this is this is one of those houses, that, one of those long houses, the council houses that the indigenous people were delivering. This is one mm. that Candidius was talking about. And I was like, are you serious? Like really? Like, but but then you look at it, you sort of say, oh, okay, and it's it's part again, it's part of a larger image, and I'm, I'm ah, sorry to say now that I didn't reproduce the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. I should have known I was talking to humanity, humanity's crowd, right? It's exactly. familiar with it images, right? In our history, I should have. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be good okay. because maybe that's also a two-part-time picture, yeah. and maybe you know, then you can also say something in terms of light. I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm very confused about these prostrating. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks to me like they're kind of juggling or, you know, doing some, you know, fighting with each other. I'm not sure what this helps. I think yeah. they're, they're, are they holding a person? Yeah, yeah it looks that's, like they're holding a person. I, I thought the yeah. two in the middle, right? Look yes, yes. Fighting. And I'm, I'm curious, was the character, the, the text written? Yeah, what well, does it say? Because yeah. then, you know, then you can make a connection all the way cultural memory. Yeah. In terms of the Taiwanese <laughs> parliament, they're always fighting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway, it's very interesting. Yeah. And, <laughs> and Julie asked some specific, specific questions. So it's, I don't think, but the question is that uh, have, have ever, like the Koyet, the artist, mm -hmm. been to Taiwan? I think he's, oh, no, no, he's not. He's, Koyet, Koyet is not an artist. So, he's like, not. like these person, they all wearing very heavy clothes. Yeah. But in Chen Di's records, you mentioned, like, they're naked. Yeah, that's it's true. Like, yeah. so it's, it's quite unrealistic. And uh, I think, and there are some deer heads. I don't know because, like, they have the deer hunting thing. Yeah. So, is that the representation of the European deer, kind of re to refer to the deer hunting in Taiwan? <laughs> and also, like, uh, ask uh, what's the text. So, uh, after this specific question, I have a larger question. So, uh, uh, were, th were th are there any conflicting contents between the 17th century China and Dutch in ter terms of the records or description of the, uh, the dig indigenous people's life as their representation of the otherness? Mm -hmm. That's a larger question. Then. Yeah, um, oddly enough, there, so Chen Di's account and Candidius's account are largely, um, uh, what's the word, they, they match oh, okay. very, very closely. Okay, okay. Candidius, is, his account is a lot longer, he gives a lot more detail, mm -hmm. but he doesn't contradict anything Chendi says. Mm -hmm. So far as I know, Chendi doesn't contradict anything he says. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the, organ, the, the, the way in which they discuss indigenous practices are slightly different. So Chendi has this line where he says, and I'm trying to remember, I, I don't have the Chinese at hand, but um, Emma Dung and Lawrence Thompson construe this line in Chendi as saying, men and women, have switched places in the sense that like women are on top and are on the bottom, yeah, yeah. and they interpret that as a um, as a way of saying that the gender the, there's gender inversion. It's called a matriarchal society. Well, a matriarchal <laughs> society, right? But it could also the Chinese could also be understood as like they exchange places freely, like they constantly like oh. there's a fluidity between oh. their roles in society, mm -hmm. um, and you get some of that with. Um, Candidius, the, the, his account of the inhabitants, where he's trying to describe the fact, not just that women and men have sort of switched roles, uh -huh. but that there's like a, a kind of um, fluidity in what in what they do. So sometimes the women are in authority when they're priestesses, and other times they take control, they take orders from men, but then other times men seem to be at the mercy of women, but other uh -huh. times on the hunt, for example, they are in control. Uh, they, they have the, the final say, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if we read these articles, if we read them with each other, I say that we can also understand what Chandi is saying is something like men and women exchange places freely. Not, not that there's like a, a permanent gender inversion, mm -hmm. he's, he's really, but, but that he's trying to say something more complex that would tally with what yeah. Candidius is also trying to tell us. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I've, I've become very interested in both of these accounts and the role that women play. Yeah. Um, not just in the sense that we know that colonized others are often feminized, mm. you know, that they're seen as somehow, and they're either seen as children or as women, something to be conquered, they're sexualized, they're fetishized in certain kinds of sexual ways, but that actually they tell us something about authority, because I'm interested in female authority, mm. um, and how, if at all, we can read these accounts against the grain mm. to 
come up. So they have their own, you know, Pandidius has his own agenda. Maybe Chandi has an agenda, or maybe he has a certain kind of perspective. But if we, if it's possible to take these accounts, and this, of course there's many, many, many more Dutch accounts and records of colonial Formosa than Chinese. But if we could somehow take these accounts and take the information they give us, and then figure out what's actually going on in terms of the kind of roles that women play and what kind of authority they have, I think that would be. I I, I hope that at some point I can make that part of this project. Yeah, I'm interested in this fifth lecture about women's role. Well, I know, so am I. I wish I'd have written it, right? You know. <laughs> it, but it's it's proven harder than I. I mean, because I need to learn more Dutch. So this is really what's taking time. Is that it's just really hard to learn. A new language when you have all these other responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And then I need to spend some time with the Dutch materials before I really feel confident saying something. Thank you. But thank you all for your help. With, um, oh, I should mention so unfortunately, I've cut off the top, but at the very top <laughs> of, of this, oops. So near the top of this here, um, there's naked women. So there's all oh. these discussions in oh. Hindidius about women, the priestess is gyrating, and they work themselves up into a frenzy, and then they decide it's time to go hunting. And he found this completely um, abhorrent, like he just thought it was completely wrong um, and disgusting, and, and he's constantly complaining in his letters to the governor general that the women just keep getting in his way. These priestesses just keep taking, they keep diverting people from the true faith, and people keep listening to these stupid old women when in fact they should be listening to him because he's a man, he's a Christian, and uh, you know. I, so there's also all of this kind of thing going on um, in the fuller canon in the primary text that I assigned. He, he goes on at length about about women. Yeah, so I I really didn't do well with this image, did I? I should have I should have just given you. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the image that I have is a scan from Koya's work. But Koya, if you, if you Google that name, the, the title of this book, it's on archive.org. So you should be able to, to download open mm-hmm. a copy. So, so you would have a full, I think, I'm pretty sure you should have a full image of that. Actually, I have uh, questions about, um, I'm wondering, why the, uh, are there any like, missionary books on I Are there a missionary? Well, Candidius was a missionary, yeah. Oh. And Robert Junius was also a missionary. So. Um, but did you mean something more specific? Um, yeah, because uh, we saw these images and documents left um, by some travelers from European, uh, from Europe. So I'm wondering uh, whether there are any like missionaries. Well, yeah, they were. They went there in the in the in the guise of missionaries. They were specifically missionaries. So in the Dutch accounts, you have the missionaries. That's George Candidius and Robert Junius, and then you have a bunch of letters and um, like reports by Dutch East India Company agents who are of varying levels of literacy and intelligence. Um, and they, of course, all have, the missionaries and the Dutch East India Company don't necessarily have convergent interests. The missionaries are trying to convert people, and they're trying to use the Dutch East India Company, particularly Robert Junius, they're trying to use the power of the Dutch East India Company to basically use violence to, to force these villagers into submission so that they can probably convert them to Christianity. Um, and then you have the Dutch East India Company who's mainly interested in, in gaining control of their territory so they can trade and, and tax farm, basically. Get the indigenous people to pay the taxes um, as well as to trade deer skin. And, and see that some lands they can start uh, farming rice. So more, more questions. I was actually, I mean, in this discussion we were having about the images. So I was thinking, you were talking about um, why? Why is this? Is that good? Why, what's what's happening up here? I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but it seems to be that there's some kind of merriment going on. There's yeah, some exactly. Kind of tra- so it, it reminds me of this um, this representation from uh, of the Lantaran, Lant- where you have like these these are tables here that were set up. Where is the table? Sorry. Yeah, in the pavilion. Yeah, yeah these are tables the- here uh-huh. set up. Um, so the headmen of each village, they were supposed to mingle with each other and with representatives of the Dutch East India Company. So there was supposed to be like a merriment. There was supposed to be happiness. And like, it was like, you were supposed to be having a great time drinking and eating, mixing together. The, the, the drinking cup. <laughs> yeah. The office. Hey. Yeah. How are they there? Oh, again, it's, I don't know why I keep looking here. It's so small. It's so much easier to look. 
Um, here. And just one of the objects that we looked at, or several objects, who was it that we looked at? I guess for you, right? There's one that, no, he no. looked at them. I also mentioned this. You yeah. did this drinking cup. Yeah, yeah. No, they were they were interesting drinking cups because there were one or two and some three, three, three yeah. together and you would drink together. So it kind of is a huge So do they know where where were they from? Taiwan? They were from an indigenous part of Taiwan. 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 Yeah. So this is why I mean this is one actually one of the reasons I, I was unsure about my ability to lead the object lessons part of this course is that there's so much diversity in each of the indigenous groups, and I didn't know enough about them in, in their particularity. Um, and I also don't know how they, they each had sort of different relationships with the Dutch, and then they would trade with each other, and sometimes these Dutch artifacts would end up with other in other villages or other tribes um, for different purposes. And then you wouldn't know necessarily, you would have some inkling about where they came from, but you didn't necessarily know how that place use them, how those people use them. But it seems to me, and then what would happen is you see here, this is the staffs, they were given these staffs, and this was sort of like a platform where they would be called up and they'd be given these these staffs um, here. Why do that? It works sometimes though. Yeah. They'd be given these staffs um, and robes, and then they would sort of go back and they were meant to be, you know, having a good time with everyone. And I'm wondering if there's some element in Dutch Republican governance about interaction, like free interaction, or is there something to connect what they're doing here with, with, with what's, what's happening in this left-hand part of the, of the slide? I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. I officially have no idea, but um, now my interest is really peaked. Unfortunately, this means I have to become conversant in Dutch um, etching and art history of like the 17th century to figure out like what, how they, like the, the vocabulary of representation, right? Like the kinds of conventions they were using to represent things like the dog or the, um, the way they use light, etc. Mm -hmm. But it might be interesting because um, a lot of the times it doesn't illustrate your argument, but it actually adds to it or yeah. it subtracts it. To me, it's very interesting that both the um, depiction of the Dutch and the depiction of the Aborigines is very uh, generic, right? Yeah. So, so it's not as if you see individual Dutch there. It's, it's, it's sort of a type, right, that you see there. And it's the same, it's, it's not as if they make a big distinction between those who are supposedly more civilized than those who aren't, which would sort of play into this argument of basically making them free, mm -hmm. right? That converts yeah. on a sort of commensurate with the <laughs> or quasi commensurate scale, right? Um, and so maybe, I mean, each one knows more about art history, and probably also European art history, and if you, if you say something about this kind of generic uh, way of depicting both the Dutch and the... Mm. But I'm not doing European art Yes, of course, you're not, yeah. but you I have to I look for more images uh -huh. about that. On it. It, I mean, it would be really interesting to see, for example, whether you can find, I mean, the, the one of the Landtagen mm -hmm. that you showed, um, there the Aborigines don't look like Indians. Right? But actually, so, I think this image, it? I have a probably a clear one. So I think this part yeah. is quite similar to the one at the left corner there. Isn't it? The, the, this part looks yeah, like, 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 like the Yeah, the inside of this part. Mm -hmm. Do you think ah, so? okay. Okay. Seems like the right part of the image. Where, uh, where I think the, 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 the corner, uh, which is uh, in light, like, uh, I don't know. Um, um, you're saying it looks like this this part? Yeah, if we, that, yeah because there is, like there that, is, there is that. something on the table, uh -huh. like uh, I think from the image here. Yeah, you can have a look. There is something on the table. I don't know if this ceremony is kind of similar. Mm, yeah. Sorry. Is it? Uh, so all these engravings uh, were uh, made in 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 Holland. It's them only. Um. So I'm not sure if they were made. So the engravings, the etchings, these were definitely made. In Holland, this I know was made in Holland well after Koya had left for most mm. So there probably somebody may have read what he wrote, and then they sort of inferred they drew something that they thought was like that. So whoever drew it or engraved it or whatever, they never went to Taiwan. Now, 
These um, are up here in Dutch records at Batavia. So I would imagine that whoever was there did sketch. Like it was somebody who, who was there that sketched them, I, so far as I know. Whether or not, I mean, now I'm realizing how little I know about the origin of these images. So whether or not um, they have like a company illustrator, for example, so yeah. somebody who been trained in Holland and then comes here, I and mean, what you see is going to be based on how you were trained, right? Um, no, I think we can compare with some similar, uh, some similar uh, Dutch situation, like how the in uh, in Holland how this uh, democratic democratic systems uh, depicted in the engravings and the yeah. pictures. I mean, so the one image I have is this one that I didn't try very hard because I wasn't looking at images of how it was depicted, right? So I'm sure there's lots of others. Um, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, thank you. This is hugely. Um... And, and maybe I have a question related mm -hmm. to Chose's last question. So uh, I think you, you kind of argue that the Dutch colonizers appropriated the concept of uh, freedom and uh, um, public liberty to stabilize the Dutch colonial control, right? Well, so, or that yeah, they, that was what was in their mind when they sort of were confronted yeah. with the situation. I don't know much about the Dutch co colonial history, but I mean, is there a model that the Dutch copied, or that they already applied this to other places? So, this is something else that I would like to do more research on, but it's my understanding, as far as I know for right now, that what happened on Taiwan, this stuff that's on the top, was, was unique to Taiwan. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know that they did this anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and my thesis is the reason maybe they never did it anywhere else is because when they were colonizing Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia already had a number of what they called indigenous rulers, not indigenous in the sense of being um, uh, Aboriginal, but indigenous in the sense of just being native. They already had a bunch of native rulers already in place. So it was with these kinds of kings, these kings and rulers of like the king of Johor, for example, that they could directly negotiate and say, okay, this king is alienating, he's, he's making a trade. He's, he's making a trade pact with us. Mm -hmm. So we can sign a contract with him because he's a free agent who's alienating his right to his sovereignty to his territory to the Duchess of the Company. And this fit very nicely with what Hugo Grotius was saying that the law of the sea is the law of people should do, right? This was a legal, free, peaceful, mutually beneficial contract, right? Mm -hmm. Of course it wasn't. That's but that's how they that's how they talked about it. The only other case where we have um, and a counterexample is on the Banda Islands, the Spice Islands. So apparently the Dutch went there and it, they did have leaders there, they're called big men, these, um, what's sort of like these, these like local leaders, and the local leaders didn't want to play ball, they, they didn't want to alienate or something, they said no, we want to say, and at that point the Dutch basically wiped them out. Bloody genocide, uh, because they wouldn't cooperate. But in Taiwan, we have these villages that don't seem to have leaders. Mm -hmm. And so then that, that's very frustrating for them because they're like, well, we can't, who are we going to ask to alienate the sovereignty of their land, right? And they didn't have a democratic understanding in the sense that they thought they could vote, they could have everyone in the village vote and to alienate their sovereignty. They were looking for somebody who was the representative mm -hmm. of the community. But they didn't have any community representatives. So their solution to that was to make them up. And that was where you get this these kinds of ceremonies, which to my mind are mm. distinctive and unique to Thailand. Mm -hmm. So among the Austronesian peoples, the Taiwanese indigenous peoples are the least stratified, or, or some of the least stratified? Um, apparently the, the Sarayan are the least stratified, so that's the, self the people on the southwest coast. There's lots of different, there's like 24 or 25 different kinds, identified by anthropologists, different kinds of people, some of Taiwan, indigenous peoples in Taiwan, and some of them leaders, some of them, in fact, there's at least one or two villages that have female leaders, inherited female leadership, um, so there's a wide variety of political authority that we see among Austronesian societies, but um, one of the comparisons that's often made is between the Sarayan people and Polynesian societies, talked about by Marshall Solins, who's a very he talks about like big men. The, the influence was mainly it was um, 
that if people became powerful not through election, but through, sort of through their deeds, and if they, man if they managed to pull something off that was really important to the village or to the tribe, then they sort of had this almost material kind of power. But then once they started to do things that were not as beneficial, then the power would kind of seep to somebody else. It was very, it was very shifting and fluid. It didn't necessarily have anything to do with hereditary power or designated authority. It was just kind of whoever was in favor at the moment. It was like the big man. Um, and they talk about that the, there's some of that. I mean, some anthropologists have talked about that in relation to these people in Taiwan. I guess the problem, though, is that these are historical people. So they've been. The Soraya are not recognized by the contemporary government of Taiwan as, a, as an Aboriginal group because they say they've been sinicized that they don't exist anymore. So they're, they're extinct. However, there are people on Taiwan who claim to be Sarayan who say that they're derived from these people um, and they're trying to agitate the Taiwan government to recognize them as an Aboriginal group. And they're trying to revive the, the language of Sarayan. And there's been some anthropological uh, reconstruction of the Sarayan language because when Candidius and Junius and his successors were there, they actually composed a Sarayan dictionary and they translated the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke into Sarayan. So we have some, in, but they were using Dutch Romanized characters, you know, to, to transcribe indigenous uh, sound and language. So, so we have records of what it sounded like at the time of, of his. So they, they provided us with, with a, many different, I mean, well-organized well, kept, well organized records, right? Um, it had an invidious purpose, of course. It was mainly just like, <laughs> I have one more question. Um, or I can also we, ask it afterwards. Not, yeah. I mean, it depends when, if you want to start looking into the text more closely. It's now quarter to four. Okay. No, it's now four. Almost, Almost four, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you, you, you. Yeah, I don't mind. I mean, in a way, I feel like we're getting, we're, in, you know, we're learning more yeah, as we, we as we talk about this. So, it's, it's, okay. so yeah. my question concerns um, is the question concerning age and how do they perceive the age of people? Because from the Chinese sources, we everything that we know, and I'm I'm not sure if I didn't get lost in the timeline somewhere at this moment, but from Dutch sources, we we have this idea that they already knew about uh, which age which people did have. What a kind of... Uh, <laughs> uh, so at the age of 35, the women yeah. were uh, giving birth, and then who was the oldest one was the one who was leading the, the, the group. And then in the Chinese sources, it's, they're concentrating so much on the fact that they didn't yeah. understand actually the idea of time. And here, do you have... So a part of that is down to the fact that um, Chen Di only really saw one portion of these. So that Candidius is talking about, I think, Ten different villages, mm -hmm. and in the different villages, they have different uh, practices, yeah. slightly different practices, but largely the same. But they're slightly different. So there are certain villages that recognize age more um, specifically. They're all Sarayan, but they're different villages, so it's like different uh, dialects of a similar language or something like that. So part of the difference is down to that. The other difference is um, some of what I was talking about in my talk are reconstructions by con by contemporary current anthropologists about what was actually going on in these records. Um, and I think it's consistent with what Chen Di says in the following way. He says that when, he'll mention that when people see an elder walk by, they turn their backs, and there's a mode of respect, but they don't really know what their ages are. And I think Candidius confirms that this is the case. They're not, they don't keep record, accurate records in the way that Chinese, for example, would expect that you knew exactly who was older and younger. They tended to group people into like bands of age. So you generally knew that so-and-so was born around the time I was, so roughly my age. And we roughly know who's older and younger, but we don't really have a clear sense of what our age is precisely. And we don't always know, um, I guess the other thing that bothered them, they didn't always have the same fathers. So the women would have many children, but they didn't know who was older and younger in the sense that they didn't know whose father was whose. Um, so they didn't know necessarily, they didn't have that familial deference, right? Um, so they did have, so they had a sense of age, but they didn't keep records where they knew people's birthdays in a specific way, if that makes sense. Because they, they had these stages of life that, that they would go through, but a lot of that, like where I say, like at age 35, 40, that's a modern reconstruction of about what age they would start doing things, but they didn't have that conceptualization at age 35 and age 40, it was just sort of like this 
general group of people that we know is born around the same time. This is when they start to do X, Y, or Z. I would be, I mean, just, I think I'm thinking that it would be interesting to look at if it would be possible you know, if there are enough sources to know what's their concept of time. Because they have to have some concept of time and age. But yes, they yeah, have, if they have age, right. We have, yeah. we have to know yeah. that it was there. But it, the question is how how did it work in the sense? Yeah. yeah. So there is a village called Fabulon. And um, we know that they actually have words for older and younger, explicitly, like, and that's recorded in the, in the Dutch libraries. But in the surrounding villages closer to the Dutch fort, they, they didn't. They didn't have such words. I know that. I, I can say that as far as I know. But um, so we would imply that some of the villages did have a keener sense of who was older and younger, and that was more important to them sociologically, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, but they, they must have had a sense of age because they had a sense of, well, they had a sense of cyclical time with the harvest and the deer hunt. Um, and they had a sense of time in terms of people aging or some, and entering different phases of life. But they didn't have a sense of, I, I think Chandi, this is again to me something we can think about in relation to what Chandi was saying and was not saying. They didn't have a, a very, very keen sense of historical record keeping. Mm -hmm. That would enable them to really fulfill Confucian ideas of filial piety and deference to rulers and deference to fathers and things like that. Uh, do we know about uh, life expectancy? Uh, uh, yeah, so apparently life expectancy was pretty good in the future 60s. Um, because, so one reason was. You, you all read Pendidius's text, right? So you remember, do you remember the passage on the abortion where he describes it? Them? So one possibility that the life expectancy was so long is that they were eating deer meat, they were very well fed, um, they had good nutrition, but that women were dying in childbirth was often. So they were waiting. So actually massage abortion statistically was healthier for women than having children. Um, so they weren't, women were living longer because they were dying at age 16 from giving birth. They were waiting until their late, their, like, well, we would estimate to their late 30s, and then they started having, and then by then they could only have a few children. They couldn't have like 12, they could have like four. Um, and not, yeah. My grandmother had 13 children. Woohoo! 18 pregnancies, 13 children. They were cows, they didn't leave birth control. Like, I, I've had two pregnancies, and they just about wiped me out. I can't even imagine having. Like being constantly pregnant. It's a tremendous labor. It's, it's just so much work. Um, but these women, Ms. Ryan's is like, I didn't worry about it. Well, I mean, they had to have a massage abortion, which is crazy. Yeah, but apparently, the safest way to have an abortion, like in a very early stage of pregnancy, is a safe procedure. John Shepard is an Indian. Quite interesting. Okay. Yeah, safe, uh, yeah, safer than child, certainly. So right. safer than um, okay. then you might think of Well, not today. <laughs> Probably not. Um, I don't know. Anyway. But, but they weren't living today. They were living in the 17th century. Exactly. You know, but then, <laughs> it was a, for them. All right.